Good afternoon to everyone, um, wherever you are today. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm going to be your host for the next 30 minutes, uh, discussing what's, uh, what best practices and tips there are around Citrix deployments. Um, my name is George Spears. I'm a technical services architect for Novasco. Been working for Novasco for about two and a half years, and I specialize in Citrix technologies, architecting, consulting, management of enterprise level Citrix farms. My main areas of interest are Synapse and Desktop and Netscaler. I'm also a Citrix technology professional, and there's just 50 around 50 of these uh, CTPs around the world. So that makes me pr very proud to be one of those. And I'm also the second CTP in Ireland. So if we have a bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about best practices and tips around different products, such as antivirus, app layering, policies from both Citrix and Microsoft. Um, optimizations, graphics, ESX, Skype for Business, PVS, provisioning services, MCS, machine creation services, and WEM, which is workspace environment management. And the first uh, recommendation today is around uh, hypervisor introspection. So I'm not sure if you're aware of the term or you use hypervisor introspection, but the benefits of introspection is that there is no antivirus agent that needs to be installed on the Citrix desktops. So this really reduces free print and resource consumption of each Citrix desktop because no agent is actually required. So the uh, introspection piece sits at the hypervisor level, um, but it isn't designed to completely replace traditional antivirus. So you have your Sophos and um, other, other fenders where you have an agent on the desktop and it's not designed to replace those. It's really designed to complement your existing uh, antivirus deployments just as an added layer of security. Um, introspection, it doesn't depend on signatures. So the way your agents depend on signatures to keep them up to date. To date. Um, introspection doesn't work like that. Um, it actually uses techniques and it uses those techniques to detect, you know, zero day attacks, uh, kernel level malware, memory violations, and so on. Uh, Bitdefender are a company that partnered with Citrix um, last year to uh, provide hypervisor introspection uh, for Send Server, which is Citrix hypervisor. Um, and last year there was actually a a big outbreak of WannaCry. I'm sure you're all aware of the WannaCry outbreak. Well, Bitdefender actually prevented WannaCry um, for workloads running on uh, Send Server. Um, so, as I say, Citrix have partnered with Bitdefender, um, and that means that Bitdefender has a introspection, and they use their APIs to in interact with Send Server to protect Citrix workloads that run on that hypervisor. But there are other fenders that provide this introspection, such as Sophos, and Sophos can run on ESX. And there will, there will be other uh, fenders as well that provide the same solution. And on the note of antivirus, we can talk about exclusions. So um, exclusions are always a, a good idea to exclude certain processes just to make sure that they don't uh, hamper any Citrix level performance. It's always a good idea to keep on top of recommendations because you know antivirus exclusions that you make or implement today aren't necessarily going to be you know recommended in a couple of years when new products are released or when new or uh, old products are um, discontinued. So it's always a good idea to keep up with the trend of uh, the latest recommendations from Citrix and Microsoft. Um, the, the below uh, at the bottom of the slide, there's a link from a Citrix blog that gives you a list of Citrix recommended antivirus exclusions. So if you can see in the, the top left, we've got uh, exclusions for PVS server, and these are just a couple that I've handpicked. So the page file, the PVS V disks, so the VHD V disks, VHDX disks. Um, if you look at the receiver for Windows, you've got the self-service.exe process. It's recommended to exclude that from antivirus exclusions. The PVS target devices, you're recommended to, again, uh, exclude the page file, um, ex exclude the write cache disk, and so on. So um, definitely worth checking out that blog at the bottom and doing a bit of a search on Google to see what the latest recommendations are for antivirus exclusions. But all, as always, it's good advice that before you um, before you do any exclusions, you should consult with your security teams. App layering, I'm not sure if anyone here uh, uses app layering, but if you do, uh, 
sometimes I get asked the question of, are you allowed to join the packaging machine to a domain? Um, and it's fine, uh, you can join the packaging machine to a domain, but just make sure to remove it before finalizing an image. Um, so in my opinion, the only layer that should be joined to the domain is the platform layer. You might wonder why um, some of the packaging machines need to be joined to the domain. So one, one good example would be uh, when you're creating security accounts, such as if you're creating local user accounts, or if you're, for example, adding a domain admin account to the local administrators group, um, you can only do that in the OS layer. And the reason being is the OS layer is the only layer that can write to the SAM database, which is the security accounts manager database. And to add, obviously, domain admins to a local administrators group, you need to be on the domain. So the um, ultimatum here is, yes, it is fine to add your packaging machine to the domain, but just temporarily add it. Once you're going to finalize, make sure you remove the packaging machine from the domain before you finalize the layer. And on the note of app layering, uh, when you're creating application layers or when you're installing, say, for example, the Citrix VDA, don't copy any of the installation files or the ISO files down to the packaging machine. So I was at Citrix Synergy um, a couple of weeks ago. I was just around two weeks ago, and a Ron Ogles, Ron Oglesby from Citrix, he actually made this point, and it makes sense. Um, if you have, for example, Office 2016, and you're going to create a app layer from Office, if you copy the ISO file, and the ISO file could be one, two, three gigabits, if you copy that to the package machine, straight away your uh, your application layer disk will expand to one, two, or three gigabyte. Um, so you really don't want that. You want to make the application layer as small as possible. So what you want to do is when you're uh, creating applications, make sure you just run the uh, installers from a network share, just to make sure that you're not expanding the layer any more than you should. Citrix policies, um, as a general housekeeping tip, you should always go through and review certain policies, review what you don't need um, or what you do need. You know, if you've probably through your career deployed many different versions of Citrix farms, you know, from 6.5 to 7.1, 7.6, up to 7.15, up to 7.17. And throughout all those deployments, you know, there's different Citrix policies that are created um, and there's different policies that apply to different operating systems and different versions of Citrix farms. So often you'll find that uh, people uh, will create policies and then they uh, forget about them and those policies as they upgrade don't necessarily still have to be there. So it's a good housekeeping tip is to just go through, maybe even if it's only twice, twice a year, you know, every six months, go through your Citrix policies, just have a review and check, you know, do I, stu do I still need this um, or do I not need this and just do a bit of a cleanup. Um, it's also wise to check policies that are enabled by default. So for example, at the bottom picture, you can see that you know audio redirection is enabled by default, network drive redirection and uh, client drive redirection is enabled by default, but that might not be uh, ideal for your organization. Maybe you don't need that. Um, so it's always good to go through and look at the policies that Citrix are enabling by default and just uh, make sure that you just, just disable what you don't need because it will reduce um, the amount of virtual channels, I say virtual channels that are running by doing that. Citrix policies, um, don't, uh, don't apply policies that don't apply to your FDA version. So this is a good example, I've seen this before, you know, you're, you're applying the session limit policy to server operating systems and then you wonder why it doesn't work. So if you look at the bottom, actually, Citrix Studio tells you that this policy only applies to certain desktop OS VDAs. So make sure when you're creating policies and applying them, that they actually are applying to both your server or desktop OS, and make sure that they're applying to that version of VDA that you're using as well. Citrix have a couple of built-in templates that they've created since Synapse and Syn Desktop 7.6 Feature Pack 3. Um, so you can see here, high server scalability is one, optimized for WAN is another. So these are really good starting points to get you up and running, get you off the ground. Um, so if you're, for example, you depend on a good WAN performance, you could start off with using the optimized for WAN template. And that just includes different policies that Citrix have enabled, best 
based on their recommendation, but you can further tweak that policy template to your liking. So this is a good uh, a good place to start, um, good building blocks for your policies. Disclaimers, um, I guess pretty much every company will probably use disclaimers to some degree. So when you're logging on, you have maybe a security message or a message to accept the terms of your, your computer or ICT usage policies. So what I find is, you know, we have policies or disclaimers on um, on Citrix desktops and maybe users could log on and maybe to go and get a grab a coffee, it's in the morning um, and the desktop is still waiting for the disclaimer to be, or the disclaimer to be uh, accepted. So what this actually does is whilst the user hasn't accepted the disclaimer, the Citrix director monitoring tool still is recording the logon. So if, for example, a user walks off and the disclaimer is sitting for one minute, that will add to logon time and director. So it will really skew your uh, logon uh, monitoring and your reports. So what I tend to do is actually disable disclaimers on the desktop and move them to the storefront uh, user interface. Or if you're using Netscaler, move the disclaimers to Netscaler, the, the main logon page, so that users accept it and log on at that stage. And when they launch your desktops, it goes straight through and we get better accuracy uh, for our logon times in Director. AD sites and services, um, if you have sites that span multiple geolocations, so maybe, for example, you have an office in London and an office in New York, it's always best to configure sites and services to match your organization. Um, so you'll have a site for London and you'll have a site for New York, and there will be subnets associated with that, those sites, and there will be deliver, uh, AD controllers, domain controllers associated to those sites as well. What you don't want is a for example, a London subnet, maybe an office subnet associated with a site in New York, because what that means is if your users are logging on to a desktop in London, um, using from that subnet, with the subnet again is uh, associated with New York, so they're going to authenticate with New York uh, domain controllers, and that's not a good thing for logon. It'll add a lot of latency. So when you want to make sure that your sites are uh, configured correctly as per your organizational layout. Optimization on images is a, a big thing. It reduces log on times, plus it increases the performance of your desktops. So I've done a lot of work with log ons and optimization in the past. So you can see here, I've created a server 2016 optimization script and a server 2012 R2 optimization script. Um, and then some tips to reduce log ons by 20 seconds, which is just by optimizing an image. If you want to take a screenshot, take a screenshot. And again, the, the webinar is all about it as well. It's being recorded as well. So you can, you can always catch up at a later stage. Harden your servers and desktops. Um, this is a security uh, recommendation. So Citrix have published a PDF to harden your synapse and desktop deployments. If an attacker manages to break into one of your Citrix desktops, what you really want to do is make it as hard as possible for him to, him to uh, spread out to other systems or other parts of your infrastructure. So it's always a, a critical piece is, is hardening your deployments. Legacy graphics mode. If you have Windows Server 2008 or 2 or Windows 7, use uh, legacy graphics mode, that's what it's for. If you have um, newer operating systems such as 2012 or 2 or uh, Windows 8 or Windows uh, 10, you have to stop using le legacy graphics mode because it's not supported by Citrix. Um, also, legacy graphics mode is only supported in 7.15 LTSR after that version. So after 7.16 and above, it's no longer supported and you have to start using adaptive display V2, which is the next generation. So what is an adaptive display V2? So it's really a mixture of both H.264 compression and then a new um, codec from Citrix called Thinwire Plus. So H.264 compression has been around for a long time in, uh, in the Citrix, Citrix world and general internet. And it means less bandwidth, but more CPU because less bandwidth, the data is compressed, but to compress that data, we need to use more CPU. And then Thinware Plus, um, it doesn't use that same level of compression, so it takes up more bandwidth, but at a, a cost of less CPU. So it's really, you now have the option. So we're using uh, Adaptive Display V2 
it's a policy. You can have the option of ever doing full screen H.264 compression, selective H.264, or do not use um, H.264 at all. So if we look at this uh, page, we can see in the green, this is content, this is a fit. So using active H.264 policy, we have H.264 compressing green content, which is green. Um, left green as anything in red and blue is text and uh, images there's more static contact uh, content and what happens there is Thinmar Plus uses that and it processes that data instead so you have a bit of the best of both worlds you're compressing the moving content so yes you're reducing bandwidth for the moving content you're using a bit more CPU but on the other hand you're using Thinmar for the rest of the screen um, it's using less CPU and um, a bit more bandwidth so you're really just getting that balance a bit Accessible for us. Um, the great thing about select adaptive display is you do have the control to configure it how you like. Group policy, um, don't let regular desktop or server teams control GPUs. The only guys that know how to best apply policies to Citrix environments is the Citrix administrators because we understand how end user computing works. So it's really best to practice to have you be in control of a group policy so you don't uh, so there's no uh, policies that are created that may um, hamper experience or performance of Citrix environments. F uh, FMX Net3, if you ESX, you really want to do away with E1000 NIC. So if you are unsure what NICs you're using, go through all your Citrix desktops, your FDAs, your delivery controllers, storefront servers. Double check what NIC you're using. If you're using E1000, put in your change controls to change those over to FMX Net3 NICs. FMX Net3 NIC gives you better performance. And it also takes up less resource on the hypervisor than the E1000 emulated NICs. On PVS, for example, no longer supports uh, E1000 since ESX5 as well. And the same for Netscaler. If you're using E1000, stop. You want If you're upgrading to Netscaler 12, you're going to run into issues with um, interface flap and packet loss. So make sure E1000 NICs are gone from Netscaler and you're using FMX Net3s. And keep firmware versions up to date. Firmware isn't just about fixing bugs or new features. Actually, with firmware updates as well, Citrix optimized code. And as this example, VPX 1000 running Netscaler 11.1 processed 550 SSL transactions per second. Look at the 12, uh, Netscaler version 12 processes 2700 SSL transactions per second. And that's just with a simple upgrade. So it's always uh, another good reason to keep your uh, Netscalers up up to the latest and greatest versions. PVS, and this applies to MCS as well. If you use PVS, um, make sure you're using uh, cache and device RAM with overflow to hard disk. That is your write cache mode. It will offer the best performance. What happens is your writes, when you boot up PVS images, your target devices, they are in a read-only mode. They use a read-only feed disk and they're write, writing data to RAM. RAM is quickest, it's quicker than disk. So if you look at the table, this is a difference. Writing to RAM, write IOPS peak 7.9, writing to disk at a massive 376. And then the average write IOPS to RAM is not 0.4 versus 34 to disk. So you really see the difference there. What you want to do is size your RAM write cache appropriately and make sure writes to disk is kept at a minimum. And if you do have to write to disk, make sure you use flash storage. Skype for Business, if you use Skype for Business in the HDX optimization pack, make sure that your audio quality is set to medium, optimized for speech. The, uh, the hint is in the name. This isn't the default method, by the way. If you deploy Citrix, the default audio method isn't um, optimized for speech. And also, you know, this isn't a recommendation by Citrix. It's actually a requirement if you're using Skype for Business. So make sure it's set the quality to medium. Storefront, if you're doing any storefront um, sizing, Citrix testing the storefront server with 8 gig of RAM for VCP was able to handle 200,000 connections at 15 logons per second. So it really just shows how little RAM and CPU you can apply to storefront to get, uh, you know, handling a lot of a lot of connections at scale there. So storefront uh, can, can deal with a lot at a low uh, resource rate. Adaptive transport, if you've used adaptive transport, Happy days. If you've not used adaptive transport, you really should start considering it. It's released in 7.13 and above. In 7.16, send up, send desktop, it's enabled by default. So using, uh, actually I done a test and using EDT adaptive transport, 45 megabyte 
battle copy at 200 milliseconds, completed 36 uh, seconds faster than a TCP copy with only 100 milliseconds latency. So that really speaks volumes of how well adaptive transport can transfer your ICA protocol. So basically adaptive transport transfers the ICA protocol over UDP. Historically, it was always TCP. So we still have the option of TCP, um, but the uh, preferred route, if especially in latent connections, is definitely UDP. It just gets your data to and from the, the destination quicker. WEM, um, we've always applied group policies, printers, um, map drives, log on scripts, etc. for group policy, and that impacts log on time. What WEM does is combats that and does a reverse. So it, it, it uh, logs the user on um, the fastest. So we log a user on as quick as possible, and then we apply the printers, then we apply the group policies, type settings such as the map drives and so on. Um, so it's all about user perception. The quicker we can get user to log, log on and see their desktop screen, the happier they're going to be, um, the better experience they're going to have. So WEM has a agent which runs on a Citrix desktop. And what happens is it has a bunch of actions. So when a user logs on, they don't get all the group policy stuff because we've now moved that to WEM. Once the user's logged on, they see their desktop, the WEM agent spins up, checks the user, checks the actions, applies the different printer policies or the different the log, uh, drive maps and so on um, to their environment after they've logged on. So WEM is available for enterprise customers and above with active Citrix Success Services subscriptions. Another thing WEM is good at doing that, and this is just another one of the things it can do, is um, manage RAM. So it's quite uh, quite common for users to log on, um, open a couple of Internet Explorer tabs, leave for lunch or leave for the day, and that RAM is still held on the machine. And that affects shared environments, such as shared desktops, where um, multiple users are using the same type, same system, they're all contending for RAM. So what WEM does is when that user logs or say they go home or they go for lunch, WEM can detect when the process is, is idle. So in this case it's Internet Explorer, it uses 345 mega RAM. So WEM then detects that it's idle, it's not being used and it, it takes the RAM away. So you can see on the right it's now reduced that RAM uh, count to 284 megabyte. And this is just one case. So you could have 10, 20, 30, maybe up to 100 users that have, that have went idle throughout the day. And this WEM really takes back RAM. So it's a great, another great feature that's built into the product. So that's really the end of the, um, uh, the webinar. It's, it's flew by. If you want a lot more tips, you should visit this website below. It's my own. Um, I'm not biased, but there's over 200 tips and tricks that I've found from uh, all sorts of content from the internet and through my own experience. So if you can't get enough of the tips, can't get enough of the tricks, then I suggest you go here and, um, and check out the different tips that may, may be use, useful to you. If you have any questions, about this webinar, uh, please email me, george.spears at novasco.com. Um, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, but other than that, thanks again, and I'll see you next time.